Hey, welcome to the collective. We're so excited as we continue in worship. We have been doing worship in a way that we start with thanking God. Today, as I was um, spending time with the Lord, I was worshiping and the Holy Spirit highlighted a scripture. And this is so amazing to remind us why we enter his gates with thanksgiving. This scripture is out of Romans 1 from verse 18 to 24. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For these invisible attributes, namely has eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world, in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. This is so important. Paul is telling us that, one, that we have no excuse to not thank God. To dishonor God by not thanking him is saying to God, we don't need you. And he says that if you say you have an excuse, he said, look around you. Look at the mountains. We that are in Washington state, we see the mountains, we see the trees, we see the rivers, we see the valleys. And he says, we will have no excuse on the last day to not worship God with thanksgiving. And this is exactly why we worship him saying we are thankful. But the alternative to not thanking God, he says here that uh, he said, they, for although they knew God, we know he exists, but they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish heart was darkened. It means they became foolish. They became like when, when, you, when, when you've become a place that you've become callous. But then he said that their hearts were darkened. What The Bible says out of the heart comes the abundance of life. Out of our heart should come beauty, should, be, should come gratefulness. But he's saying that the alternative to not thanking God and honoring God is darkness. It's darkness. So when we find ourselves in that dark place, we need to ask ourselves, have we entered his gates with thanksgiving? Have we entered his courts with praise? And that's why we want to start right now. Before I pray for you to prepare your heart, because we're going to thank God. Thanking God is the key to worship. That's why he said that is the gate. We can enter or have access to him without entering his gates with thanksgiving, without honoring him. Our heart becomes dark. So let us pray. Father, Lord, we just want to thank you for that I mentioned the mountains, I mentioned the valleys, I mentioned the rivers, I mentioned the seasons, snow, fall, spring, winter, summer, for that everything that you have made, we have no reason to not wake up and thank you. We have no reason to not thank you for our breath, our life, the provision you've given us, even the things that we have not seen yet, even things we are still expecting, we thank you for them. Let us thank the Lord right now. First and foremost, let's thank him for the breath that we are breathing, that we are alive, that we have life. Look around you. Let's thank him for the house that we get to meet with one another in a home with our friends and family. There are churches that cannot do that in, in Asia, in Africa. Yet we get to meet together with our family and friends in a home. Let's thank him for the meal that we share together. 
we have food to eat. It is by His grace that we have food. Let's thank Him for our health. We are alive right now. We are not in a hospital. We have health to do what we are called to do. Let's thank Him for that. Let's thank Him for the cross. Our beginning started at the cross. Without the cross, we will have no way to come to the Father. Let's thank Him for His blood that was shed on the cross that gives us access and alignment to be with Him. Let's thank Him for the Holy Spirit. He said the Holy Spirit will remind us of everything that Jesus taught us. Without the Holy Spirit, we can't even have a revelation of the Word of God. We can't even have a revelation of prayer, of worship. We can't even know what that's about. We can't see Jesus in His glory. We can't even know the Father. So let's thank Him for the Holy Spirit. Now let's thank Him for our leaders. Let's thank Him for the leaders, the godly leaders of our nation, the godly leaders in our churches. There's a remnant rising up. Let's thank Him for those leaders that have laid down their life that have decided to use their life as an arrow to point to Jesus. Let's thank Him for our children. There's an attack going on in America, but we can thank God for the children because they are the Lazarus generation. They are in a, a generation that will crush the head of the serpent and He's worried about them. Let's thank Him for these children Let's thank Him for our marriages. Marriage is an institution of God. Let's thank Him for marriages. Any marriage that comes up to your head, starting with yours, begin to thank God for marriages. Let's thank Him for His people. He said that every tribe and tongue will come together and worship Him. Some of his people are not even here in America. Some of them are in other continents. Let's thank him for his people around the world. We're a big family in Christ Jesus. Let's thank him. So the first key is to enter his gates with thanksgiving. The next key, the Bible says, is enter his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and bless his name. How do we enter his courts with praise? Praising is praising him. And how do we do that? Let's begin to praise his name. God's name, are, they are his character. I, we praise him because he is love. We praise him because he is joy. We praise him as Jehovah Jireh. We praise him as Yahweh. We praise Him as our healer. We praise Him as our deliverer. We praise Him as our comforter. We praise Him as our good shepherd. We praise Him as our Lord. Just begin to praise Him in, your, in the house churches right now. Begin to think about His faithfulness. Just begin to praise Him for the things that He has done and the things that He is doing. And Praise His name. His name is very important. The Bible calls Him Yahweh. The Bible calls Him Yeshua. The Bible calls Him our advocate. He's our lawyer. The Bible calls Him our helper. Begin to praise Him. That is the key as we praise and enter His gate. This is worship. And finally, just begin to just Tell him how much you love him. Tell him how much you love him. That is ministering unto him. Right now, wherever you are, begin to minister to him. And if all you can say is, I love you because you first loved me, tell him that. That is how we worship.
Father, Lord, we just want to say thank you for this time that we got to praise, thank, and worship you. Lord, as we prepare for the message, Father, we ask you to touch our hearts. Let your words not be words that we hear and agree with with our mind and walk away. But let your word fill us with a transformation power that we will not only be hearers of your word, but doers of your word. Let your word just transform us so that we can line up our, our life with Jesus. And Lord, we also pray for the message that's coming forth, that you just bless it and let it bear fruits, a hundredfold fruit. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey Collective, welcome back. We're going to move into part two of being a man or woman after God's own heart. And you'll remember if you saw the first part that we talked about what it means to be a man or woman after God's own heart. We talked about this idea that a person after God's own heart is someone who understands their position, which is their identity, and also understands their purpose which is their mission in Christ. And so those are two things I want to really hit on today is how do we understand, how do we identify both who we are identity-wise and what we should be doing for the king. If we walk through life not understanding those two things, it's like we're waking up as strangers in someone's house every day without knowing what we can eat, what clothes we should be wearing, what is our schedule for the day, Who are we serving? Are there other people in the house that we should be helping out? Are there other people in the house that should be helping us out? And so some of us live our whole lives not knowing our identity in Christ. It is foundational. It is key. And without that, we can't truly become a man or a woman after God's own heart. So I want to hit on this. And I'm going to be referencing Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 12, where Paul really tells us about who we are in Christ. All right. So it says in verse 12, it says, So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And so, again, it, this references our first part. Remember, we talked about the spiritual perspective, and we also talked about the fleshly perspective. And this, this cycle that we get into, either we're living according to the Spirit, or we're living according to the flesh. And he goes on to say in chapter 14, for all who are led by the spirit of God are sons of God. For you do not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, and I can dare say as daughters, by whom we cry Abba or Abba Father. This this term Abba Father, that's a term of endearment. It's like saying, not Lord God Almighty. It's like saying, Daddy, Daddy, can you help me? Daddy, I am part of your family. And so right here, we discover our true identity in Christ is that we are sons and daughters of Christ. And in the last message, we talked about the fact that there is always a battle going on for our souls. We talked about the fact that when Satan tempted Jesus in the wilderness, he didn't say, I'm done with you, Jesus, forever. He said, I'm going to come back at an opportune time. And if, if Satan is prowling around like a lion, searching out the Messiah, he's certainly searching us out too. He's trying to tempt us. He's trying to divert us. All right. And so if by default, we are sons and daughters of God, and by default, there's always a battle going on, then we have been given both our position and our purpose in Christ. By default, if you are the son of a king, what does that make you? You are a prince. If you're a daughter of a king, you are a princess. This is the identity that we each need to adopt according to the Bible so that we can define who we are and what we're doing. So if we are a prince or princess and there's always a battle going on, then you are a warrior prince or a warrior princess. All right? That doesn't mean necessarily that we're slaying things with a sword, although it may come to that someday. We are slaying things by the blood of Jesus. We are slaying things with spiritual weapons, with the word, with our worship, with prayer, This is our identity, and this is our mission as we move forward. So again, back to Romans, starting in verse 19, it says, For the creation waits with eager longing 
for the revealing of the sons of God. That's you and I. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage. And I think that speaks to us when we don't know our identity. We are absolutely in bondage. When we know our identity as a son or daughter, a prince or a princess in Christ, we three things disappear. First of all, we have nothing to hide. We have nothing to fear and we have nothing to prove. And if you take those three, how often are those three things in our life the source of conflict, the source of heartache and depression? If, if I walk into a room and I don't know anyone, I don't know who I am, I don't know what my plan is for the day, do you see how fear can come into my life? And from that fear, when someone, hey, who are you? Oh, and we have to start proving ourselves. When we get into arguments, nine times out of 10, if I get in an argument with my wife, it's because I have something to prove. If she hasn't talked to me the right way or, you know, she calls something out in me, I'm trying to prove that, no, I'm right and you're wrong. And yet, as a prince, knowing that my Savior has died for me, I have none of that. I have no fear. I have no shame. I have no pride. And those three things, when you know your identity, completely go away. And it transforms the motivation by which we, we act out. Are we doing it in love or are we doing it in selfishness? And those are our two options right there. Everything is either motivated by love for others or by selfishness. Okay, back to Romans chapter 8 in verse 22. It says, For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Not only the creation, but we ourselves, we have the first fruits of the Spirit. And that's an amazing promise. In verse 24, it says, For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope at all. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, wait for it with patience. And I know this this understanding of our identity and understanding of our mission, it doesn't happen right away. It takes time and it takes patience. And it's something we, we embrace with faith and with hope. Because... As we start to understand our mission, that mission, God has gifted us with with various attributes by his grace, different gifts that we are able to accomplish our mission. And I remember growing up as a young guy in the church, we always came across this this verse, which we have here in in the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28. And it's this thing where we have to go out into all the world and preach the gospel and make disciples. And so growing up as a young guy, I always used to think, well, someday I'm going to have to grow up. I'm going to have to figure out how to train people. And I'm going to have to go into all the world. That's our mission, right? Christ gave us one of the last things he did was say, hey, go do this to his disciples. And it was always such a daunting task to be burdened as a young person because I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know who I was. I didn't know how to make disciples. I, I didn't know what it was even meant to go into all the world. Am I traveling? Am I there for a week? Am I there for a year? Do I sell them in possessions? There's a lot of confusion. And this, this verse encourages us that we've been given this grace. We have been given the first fruits of the Spirit to grow our mission. And I can promise you right now, God has put you in a place where you are on mission. That place may be as a 13-year-old, That place may be as a 33-year-old with young kids. That place may be an 83-year-old whose kids have moved on. But where you are right now is where your mission begins. This is not something we wait for, a big cloud burst to open, and suddenly we're granted our mission. As sons and daughters of Christ, we are given our identity. We are warriors, warrior princes and warrior princesses with a mission where we're at right now to start imparting God's love, not selfishness, into the world. It's as simple as that. And as we begin to move forward in that, God begins to develop a picture in us. God begins to develop a picture in our families and in our communities. And to say that we step into our mission and we know the full battle plan, we absolutely absolutely do not. There's a saying that says, no plan survives first contact with the enemy. That doesn't mean we shouldn't go into battle without a plan, just because it's going to change. But we have to be have willing, soft hearts to be 
people after God's own heart, that we will respond to the voice of the Father in the moment as we press in. And there's a great promise in the New Testament that says, don't worry about what you're going to say in the moment. The Holy Spirit will give it to you right when you need it. And that is such a great promise. But so many of us never step into that moment, and then we complain that we don't hear the Father's voice. You see, faith has to have feet. It's an action verb. We have to step into that. And when we have faith, that's when the Holy Spirit comes through. That's when we hear God's voice. And so that's a great promise for us all as we start to understand our role and understand our purposes. All right, I'm going to finish up here with the last couple verses out of Romans chapter 8, which there's obviously the Bible is full of goodness, right? Full of jewels. But I got to say, this chapter, if I had to pick one, would be in contention for like top 10 chapters in the whole Bible. Romans chapter 8, if you haven't had a chance, go, go read that. All right, we're starting, we're going to pick up again in verse 26. It says, likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. And some of us might feel weak as we go down this path. I don't really feel like a prince or a princess. I don't really feel like I'm on mission. The Holy Spirit will help you as you start to take that on. You know, it's, it's interesting. Some of us beat ourselves up so much about how we fail, how we've not followed through with the things we've, we've said we were going to do, how we're not a great father, on and on. We, we start to believe those lies about ourselves, not understanding that we are actually condemning the son of God, the daughter of God. You see, he didn't mess up. He didn't make any mistakes. And when we believe lies about ourselves, I believe it's offensive to God because he made you beautiful. He made you wonderful. All right, I'm going to pick up here now. It says, For we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Verse 27, And he searches hearts, he who searches hearts, again, we get back to this idea of God is searching out our hearts. He who searches our hearts knows what is in, my, in the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know, this is a superstar verse of the Bible, and we know for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. That's such an amazing promise. If we are called to his purpose, we have to start understanding our mission and our identity, and only then can we adopt the heart of God. You see, King David who was called a man after God's own heart, he absolutely knew his role from a young age. You remember the story of David when he was growing up? The prophet came in and said, hey, I'm going to anoint a new, a new king. And so all of David's older brothers were called in. They were strong and tall. And the prophet said, nope, not you, not you, not you. And he basically turns to Jesse and says, are these all your sons? And Jesse says, well, there is a young punk out in the field that I failed to call in, but he's not king material. He's not a candidate. And the prophet says, let God be the judge of that, basically. And he calls him in. And the prophet said, hey, this is the man, this young boy, David, who's been out with the sheep. This is a man after God's own heart. How many of us have had a legacy like that cast over our lives where at a very young age, maybe our parents, maybe a grandparent, maybe someone in the church said, this young person is going to be a great and mighty warrior for the king. That is a legacy we need to be leaving with our own kids because it's true. It is the reality. Through the sacrifice and the redemption that Christ Jesus has given us, we are all heirs and co-heirs with Christ in God's kingdom. That is our identity. And when we start living that out for ourselves, when we start treating other people, men, are you treating your wife like a princess of the king? When she walks in the room, do you adorn her with, with wealth of blessings? How about our kids? Are we treating them like royalty? How about ourselves? Are we believing lies about ourselves that don't line up with the word of God? Because if we are, we are undercutting the purpose of Christ in our lives. We are, and then so doing, undercutting the mission that we have in our lives. The only way we adopt the heart of the Father is to understand our, our mission by understanding our identity in Christ. So I'm going to pray us out. 
this is so key. You need to go to Romans chapter 8 and digest this, read this, and adopt it for yourself. Because if we miss this, we're always going to be walking around like orphans, waking up in a house that we don't even know who we are or, or what we need to do for the day. And unfortunately, the church is in a place where we're orphans throughout the week. We come to church on Sunday and we don't fit in. We don't have a spot. We don't know our identity. And so that's my prayer for us today. Lord, that through you, through your word, you would teach us who we are. Teach us to see ourselves like you see us. Teach us to believe the truth about ourselves and our families. Teach us to be men and women of purpose who walk out our lives with great faith and step into the unknown, knowing that you're going to meet us right there in the moment. Lord, help us to respond with spiritual eyes in obedience to your word. Help us to know your voice. Help us to recognize where you're calling us. In Jesus' name, amen.